Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Best of Pedal Shift. Now, if you were with us last week, I said that this week's edition was going to be the wrap-up edition, episode 026 of the Erie Canal Ride, which has been, of course, the subject of the tour journals that have been released over the last several weeks. Well, as it turns out, I already did that. I did that last year. I also kind of revisited that ride and summed it up in episode number 187 of the Pedal Shift Project. So rather than re-release those, I'd encourage you to go check those out if you'd like to continue the dialogue and continue the summing up of that really, really fantastic ride in 2015. And that brings us to this edition of the Best of Pedal Shift. We're going to be featuring my very first talk with Jasmine Reese back in February of 2017. Jasmine, if you are new to her, you're in for a treat. (laughs) She is an absolute ray of sunshine. She travels the world by bicycle with her dog, Fiji. And this was the first opportunity that I had to chat with her. I've actually chatted with her twice on the show. She brings amazing perspective to all things bicycle touring and, frankly, in this edition, the vagabond life, which probably is pretty much on pause for her and for lots of other people at this point. But it's a good reminder of what's out there and what's possible. And I think that she brings an amazing perspective to everything. So without further ado, Jasmine Reese. Jasmine Reese is a violinist and self-described vagabond on a personal adventure she describes as her road school of music. On March 1st of last year, she hopped on her bicycle with her dog Fiji and violin in tow, living a boundless life full of musical opportunities. She believes in inspiring people, not just with her story, but also through the random acts of kindness and generous people she meets on a daily basis. Jasmine wants people to feel hope in a seemingly hopeless world. Hi, Jasmine, and welcome to Pedal Shift. I am very excited to have you on the show. It is a real pleasure to chat with somebody who's doing bicycle touring, I think, in a unique way. And I, I'm i just excited to hear about all of your adventures so far and sort of what there is to come. So thanks for thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I feel honored to be on pedal shift. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I think maybe we should just sort of start off by saying who you are uh, to my listeners who've never, you know, run into you on Facebook or any of the other variety of places where you pop up these days, you know, who you are and the type of ride that you're doing and your your rather famous traveling companion. Uh, my name is Jasmine Reese, and I travel with Fiji Reese. She is my wonderful doggy and best friend. And um, I have a official title that I've given to myself. It's a, uh, I'm a long distance cycling, violin playing vagabond. <laughs> so I play violin and I bicycle and I live on the road. So I consider myself a, a nomad or a vagabond as you will. And, uh, and that's a little bit about me. I mean, obviously there's tons and I could probably go on forever as we are all complex beings. <laughs> oh, totally. The term nomad and vagabond, I'm curious why that label appeals to you in the context of what you're doing, because I think that it really explains a lot uh, based on what I know about you and what your trip's been like and what your trip is to be. Well, because as we, I think Vagabond in particular probably had some negative connotation, but as we move further into the future, um, it's becoming a little bit more accepted as I think how we viewed Vagabond in the past was someone who basically lived like a homeless person and, and went went about, you know, um, just moved. So they were a nomad, but homeless, and probably um, people viewed them as freeloaders or things like that. But with the internet that we have today and so many resources such as Workaway and Wolf and couch surfing and warm showers, um, the vagabond notion has come back, but not so much as, as a freeloader or a homeless person who's moving about the earth, but a person who is actually um, connecting with other individuals in a bartering type way, whether it be in work away, ro- working for your room and board, um, or if you're on couch surfing and you're connecting and sharing cultural stories about where you've been and, and where they've been. Um, so I view myself in the new context of a vagabond, and I hope it's in a, a much more positive light where I am connecting and sharing with individuals as I go away and bartering bartering and working along um, in order to sustain my travel lifestyle. And Nomad um, has 
I think for the longest has always had a po- positive connotation of someone who just moves about and pretty much lives um, their life traveling. So, so I guess I would be both, but the vagabond title appeals to me more so because it's, it's way more, it, it encompasses more so what I'm doing as far as connecting with people and living off of the road without money being so much involved, but more so through bartering and, um, and trading uh, knowledge with people about our lives and in and, and that way connecting with people. I love this because it is a way of looking at a life viewed through the prism of, of adventure and experience rather than accumulating things and money and titles and all of that other kind of stuff. So I think that it's a much richer way to uh, go about it. What was the impetus for all of this? What Was there any one thing or was this just something that, that percolated up for you? Um, I'm pretty sure... I mean, there there were a multitude of things that finally, you know, made me say, okay, I'm going to do this. But I think for most adventurers, nomads, vagabonds, whatever you would like to say, anyone traveling long distance, something, um, they had to lose something in order to gain this lifestyle. And I say gaining this lifestyle because this lifestyle for me is, is gaining freedom. It's gaining something valuable. And, um, and you had to lose something in order to to realize that you could live this way because sometimes we feel trapped in the life of routine and security and we feel like we can't break outside of that and live a different life because we don't we don't know what's outside that barrier so it sounds it seems scary so um in order to come to the point where you can say oh I'm going to sell all my stuff and live with the insecurity of not knowing where my next paycheck is going to come from and where food is going to come from and where housing is going to come from. You have to feel like you have nothing else to lose. <laughs> and so um, so I think we all started with the idea of escaping. Um, and, that, and, that was, and that's very much true for myself. Um, I didn't have anything serious happened to me, such as losing a loved one or, or going through heartbreak or anything like that, because I've heard those stories on the road. You know, I've met people who have been ill and they've, they've suffered from cancer. And, and, they, and there are literally people that I've met who were on their last few months of life and they decided, okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be here much longer, so I need to get out there and live my life the way I want to live it. Um, I've met people like that, but I'm not like that. I more so went through a quarter-life crisis of of realizing that I wasn't living my life the way I wanted to. Um, I really wanted to be a violinist, but because of our ideas of prestige and what you should study in life and, and um, kind of trying to please other people and things like that, I didn't pursue violin because I didn't think one, I was capable and two, um, that it would give me the security I needed to be a, a good human being contributing to society in some type of economical way. So, um, so I finally got to a point where I was burned out with college and because I had spent all this money going to school, studying a subject that I didn't really want to, to study. And I became quite reclusive, which is complete opposite of, of who I am as a person. I'm normally very outgoing, um, busy all the time, but I became reclusive and lazy And that was all symptoms of depression for me at that time. And I knew I needed to change that. I needed to get, I need to exercise because I was gaining tons of weight. I gained most of my weight in college. And um, so I I needed to lose weight. I needed to get outside and regain and recapture or recapture the person that I was. And bicycling, for me, I hate gyms. So going to a gym wasn't going to do it for me. Join the club, trust me. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. There, there's an anti gym club we can both be a member of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hate I hate the gym. It's just it, it's like I said, I don't really like to be trapped. So it's it's weird that I became reclusive staying in my room, but but it happened, and I don't like to be trapped in the gym. It makes me feel like you're trapped inside this box, just kind of like a rabbit on the spinning wheel or or the hamster on the spinning wheel, you know. So I don't really like gyms. So I needed to find an activity that would keep me outside, but also help me to lose weight. So um, the bicycle was dead. And I just started riding to and from school on a on a Walmart bike. It wasn't an expensive bike or anything like that. And, um, and, and for me, it was, okay, I'll try to get to school. So I'll try to continue my education. And I'll be losing weight at the same time and getting out of the house. And um, school, I was pretty done with at that time. I tried, but 
you know, it wasn't happening. Happening. So, but the bicycle, it, it became very uh, empowering for me, and I needed that. I needed to feel empowered because I had I had lost myself. I had lost, you know, that person that was empowered at one point and confident. And when I got on the bicycle and started to change and and lose a little bit of weight and bicycle up hills that I couldn't bicycle up before and I was no longer panting and feeling like I was going to have a heart attack every time I went up a hill, it made me feel amazing. I I said, oh, my gosh, my body is changing. Um, I'm conquering things that I couldn't do before, and I'm getting better at this, this activity. And I just started asking myself questions like, oh, I wonder how far you can go on a bicycle. And from there, it just kind of spanned in, in a very short amount of time because I probably started asking myself questions like that in December. And then, of course, I went to bicycle across the country in May of 2013. So December 2012 to May of 2013 everything escalated. And I decided not to go back to school for this, the next semester and said, you know what, I'm going to bicycle across the country in order to prove to myself that I can, if I can do something like this, and this is a person who it doesn't have cycling experience, is chubby. It, also at that time, being black on a bicycle and a woman wasn't as prevalent. So, so I, I and also I didn't know how to camp. I wasn't a survivalist. All of these things of contradiction, if I could go out there and do this, then I could do anything. So for me, it was about boosting my ego, regaining confidence, and um, proving to myself that I was still capable of great things. That is fantastic. And that's such a, a great story because, I mean, you went from literally zero to I'm biking across the country in such a short period of time. <laughs> that's pretty remarkable. There's an old Irish proverb about kind of throwing your hat over the wall. And uh, uh, you know, <laughs> then you have to, you're forced to climb over the wall to go get the hat. And, and so uh, my friend James and I always say <laughs> over the wall for stuff like that. I feel like you were very much <laughs> over the wall. That is pretty great. Yeah, I was over the wall. Exactly. <laughs> that, that is that is fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, we talked about this before. You you travel with gear that's pretty atypical for a world traveler. You've got a fiddle and you've got your dog Fiji, to name two of them. Uh, I'm curious mm-hmm. how, in your cross country rides, how a setup that you've had has evolved to accommodate both your protecting your fiddle and protecting your dog at the same time. Um, well, like I said, in 2013, I pretty much set out with no experience, so it's been. Uh, you know, kind of just learning as I go. But for Fiji, I knew that leaving, we had a great bond and there was no way I was going to leave her behind for the typical three months that it takes people to bicycle across the country. It took me a lot longer, but I, I couldn't leave her for three months. And so I started researching, you know, different gear that you could take. And, and I started testing Fiji as far as her fitness level and whether she'd actually be able to do something like that. But it was still all pretty, pretty uh, last minute. And I I still am learning a lot about how to make it all work and weight and things like that. But for Fiji, um, we basically just got on the road and the first couple of weeks, she, her behavior, especially going into new homes and things like that, was pretty rough. You know, a lot of barking, a lot of growling at people. And, of course, that was all because she was new to this lifestyle. I had, you know, we had been at a stable home, and then all of a sudden now we're traveling. So she had to get used to it, and there was a time period for that. And also, I wasn't used to bicycling, and I was still learning, so I had a learning curve. And I didn't. I I hadn't been used to riding on highways and I I was nervous about letting Fiji run. I have a leash attachment that I attach her harness to and she runs alongside the bicycle. So I was nervous about letting her run on those highways, even when we were in a pretty nice sized shoulder. I just was nervous about that. So I kept her inside the dog trailer all day until we got to our next destination and I'd let her out occasionally for, you know, bathroom breaks and things like that. And that wasn't cutting it because Fiji's a high energy dog. And so when we would get to a, yeah, so when we get to a host home, she was, she was just wired. So finally, um, I did get to a trail and I felt a lot more uh, secure about letting her run for a long period of time. And so she did about seven miles. And I mean, her behavior was a complete change. When we got to our host house, she wasn't barking. She wasn't growling. She also was what I would consider a dog aggressive dog. And um, 
and she this host I was nervous about it the whole day because our our host in in Valley Forge Pennsylvania at that time um th- they had five dogs and they were all service dogs they were all tra- in training for service dog training so I said oh my gosh we're going to a place with five dogs and Fiji does not get along well with dogs so we got we got there we arrived and um Fiji had run 7 miles for the first time with lots of breaks and things like that and she also had a I put musher seeker musher secret wax on her paws to protect her paws from um any debris and hot pavement and things like that so we got to our host house and uh Fiji was she ignored the dog <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first time I had ever seen her not growl not get into any type of tussle with another dog, I I said, wow, okay, so the secret to you is you like to run. And from there, me and Fiji on the road became a pretty good duo. I mean, she was running every day. She was playing in rivers and lakes and, and just being an amazing dog and being great with our host. And, of course, she was still learning. So if we did ever stay in a motel, um, she would learn to do quiet barks. So she'd go, roof, roof, you yeah. know, instead of a, a loud bark so we wouldn't get kicked out anywhere. So she just became amazing. And, and that, that was, of course, a learning curve for, for that. And then, of course, your second the second part of the question was about violin. For violin, I really just took a trash bag and I put that in the trash bag, the case, and uh, wrapped it on the the trailer, and that's how my my violin has rode ever since. There has been no no uh, change in in how the violin has gotten along. It's super it's been great in every climate, um, cold climates and hot climates and dry hot dry heat climates. It's done great. So um, so far, I'm satisfied with how I'm taking care of it. Who knows as things get colder or, or even more hot than what we've been. And I don't know, but so far I haven't worried much about it and it's done fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds like the, the answer or the short version of, of, for both is keep it simple. Dogs like to run yeah. violins, just keep them dry. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Pretty much dogs need, well, dogs need exercise. And, you know, I would tell people just as a disclaimer or, or warning, know your own dog. Not every dog is, is going to want to run, as much as Fiji does, and not every dog is going to, uh, you know, like this lifestyle. They're not going to accept being able to meet new people. It, I'm just lucky enough that I have a wonderful dog who loves people. She's the sweetest thing. She loves meeting new people, and she's come to love meeting dogs, and um, and she loves exercising and, and and just chasing after critters and everything else. So the fact that she has that personality that that suits well with this type of lifestyle is, is wonderful. And other people wanting to travel with their dogs will have to discern and, and discover what what is best for their dog. Yeah, it sounds like that she's learned a lot on the road, uh, probably as much as you have about how to be on an adventuresome vagabond tour just like that. So mm-hmm. that's that's kind of cool. <laughs> You uh, this past summer you crossed Canada, and I know that you've traveled extensively in the U.S. And I've got a bunch of listeners in both the U.S. and in Canada, and I'm curious, what do you think is the biggest contrast between the two countries as um, a bike tourist, um, or just you know, it, traveling in general between those two countries? Um. Well, the, the let's see. I mean, topography wise, and um, just landscape wise. To me, both are equally beautiful. Um, there was only one stretch in the U.S. It was Route 50, uh, the loneliest road in America, where I ex- experienced the same uh, sparseness in population and civilization as Canada. But Canada, for the most part, unless you're on the East Coast or, or on the West Coast, uh, it's pretty sparse in a lot of areas. So it was definitely challenging dealing with because my the way I travel is very much dependent upon connecting with people. So in Canada, there were just sections where there were no people, you know, except for a car going by on the highway. And so learning to be even more so reliant upon nature and tent and camping skills and things like that is uh, something that you need to do in Canada. But of course, Canada's gorgeous. So camping is not a big deal. Um, and uh, I just, I, I love both, you know, U S is wonderful for cycling. And, and so is Canada, I will say as far as people go, you, for me, we ha- we all have different expectations about how people will be based on 
their location and we'll have preconceived notions about people who live in the south of the U.S. or the north of the U.S., and then we have preconceived notions about people in Canada. And I think one of the biggest stereotypes about people in Canada is that they're super, super nice and, you know, they're they're just always willing to open their homes and, and be amazing. And that stereotype, for the most part, is true. But like anywhere, but like anywhere, um, you'll find good and bad people everywhere. And for and for the U.S., I would say that I experienced the same amount of hospitality um, in the U.S. as I did Canada. So, so the idea that people were going to be nicer or not in Canada is is invalid. And I will I will say that people are nice in different ways. In the U.S., the the option to be hospitable to someone is a little bit more guarded. You know, they have to break down a lot more barriers, whereas in Canada, <laughs> whereas in Canada, um, I talked to someone for two seconds. I just said hi, and I was already being invited in someone's house, <laughs> you know, mm. whereas whereas in the U.S., if I talked to someone, you know, we had to have a little bit more of a conversation before getting invited to their house is something that happens. They're running a background check. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, not today, They're Googling sure, but... you, making sure your website's there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, the, exactly. There's a little bit more digging into the person and making sure you're comfortable first before before you do that. But in Canada, I was so surprised with with how quick people were to to trust that you were a good person, and and they didn't really have to have a conversation with you to to have you in their house. When I went into Victoria, British Columbia, I had run out of water, and um, I saw a woman outside uh, watering her her um, her flowers and I asked her I just stopped my bicycle and I asked her if I could use her water hose to fill up fill up our bottles and she said no 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 come on in the house <laughs> I'll mm-hmm, get you some water mm-hmm. and she just like you know I just popped my bicycle up came in the house she said oh do you need to charge up your phone and we hadn't really had a, m- a much of a conversation except for me asking her to to fill up my water bottles so um so that happens and then you know and that's that's happened in the US too with a little bit more conversation but it's just different but it's still hospitality and I, and I'm so appreciative to you know to that hospitality wherever I come by, wherever it comes. That's been my experience in Victoria as well. I started a, a tour of the entire West Coast a few years ago, and I just found the people in Victoria to be just the loveliest people on the planet. They were just fantastic. They were just oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, just across the whole country as well. Yeah, just across the whole country. And um, another thing, too, is hitchhiking culture in Canada is is uh, a lot more accepted than here. Um, I think it's illegal in some provinces in Canada, um, but people, you'll see a lot more hitchhikers in Canada than you will in the U.S. I, I'm, it's very rare for me to see a hitchhiker or it's done a little bit more stealthily, whereas in Canada, it's very out, out in the open and, and in your face. And you see people actually picking them up, so it's not it it's not as um i guess it's not as negatively perceived in canada to to hitchhike so that was another thing that i was surprised to see I think that's a really good point because I think that the the perception in the States is that it's dangerous. I think, you know, there's mm-hmm. probably a couple of serial killers that, that got away with it. But I do know that actually it, it there are places in Canada where it's quite dangerous to do so, uh, that there's been a lot of uh, women who have disappeared along a particular highway in British Columbia. Uh, I think it's called the Trail of Tears or Road of Tears or something along those lines. Yeah, I, ha- I did research about that because I was researching highways to take and I did come across the Trail of Tears. And that was, yeah, that was done. Um, unfortunately uh about 10 years ago and it was a person taking advantage of of a first nation women um yeah. and picking them up and and that yeah that was terrible but i do know cyclists who have bicycle that now solo women and they haven't had any problems and they've hitchhiked along that road as well but of course whenever you're hitchhiking if you are hitchhiking um always take precaution no matter where you are oh, yeah. you know <laughs> certainly, certainly. Yeah, that's that's probably good advice any place. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of pivot and talk a little bit about how you're supporting yourself and your tour as you roll along. I mean, you do everything from sort of temporary jobs to you name it. And I just I, I think that that's just a fascinating way to power along. And I wanted to see what you thought about all of it and maybe name some of the things that you've been doing and uh you know, what kind of pleasure you get out of uh, living a lifestyle where you're existing from place to place, but maybe doing in- more interesting things along the way. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, so I, I busk, which is a street performance, and street performance can come in any capacity. You don't have to be a musician. You don't have to have any special um, trade or skill to do it. You just need to come up with an act that you think people will be entertained by as you perform on the street. And, um, and so that's something I'll do at farmer's markets. And if it's legal to do it in a city, because a lot of cities require uh, permits, I'll do that there. Um, but, you know, that's that's a wonderful quick way to make a little extra cash if you've run out of cash. And um, and so that's that's definitely helped me along the way. Another thing is using all of the resources that we have online to connect with people, um, such as Help Exchange, WorkAway. Those two sites are very similar in the fact that you can work in someone's home or in their business in exchange for room and board and food. And usually you only have to work three or four hours a day, and then you have the rest of the day to do whatever you'd like to do. And, and that can be one or two days. It could also be long-term, six or seven months, you know. So using those resources, also using the resources of warm showers and couch surfing where um, you can stay in people's homes for a night or two and therefore you don't have to pay for a motel or a hotel, um, c- taking a tent so that you can camp. All of those options offset cost of basic living. Um, of course, when you do need to eat and you can't rely on those uh, those resources because maybe people in the area just don't offer that, um, you do need to work. And, and I've done everything from gardening to cleaning toilets to uh, babysitting to pet sitting, you know, you just find those opportunities. And I, I like to find those opportunities via Facebook as well, because you can um, find and connect with different people. And if you're coming into their town, they know people who need this and they know someone else and their friend knows someone else who needs you to do that. And so um, just staying connected is, is the way to get those jobs and to uh, to continue to travel um, in this way is is very reliant upon people and what you can do for them and what they can do for you um, in that type of situation. And so for me, that's how I've gotten along with with very limited cash and just kind of making it as I go. And and sometimes, yes, it can be stressful. It's challenging. By no means is, is what I'm doing easy. But I like to tell people that First of all, if you're, you can struggle no matter where you are. You can struggle whether you're in one location or you can struggle traveling the world. And quite frankly, I've, tra- I've, tra- I've chosen struggling while, tra- while traveling the world because even though I'm struggling, which is a norm for anyone in life, I get to see and do so many amazing things and learn from different people. And I can truly say that at this point in time, I am not, I am happy most of the time with fleeting moment, moments of sadness or disappointment, whereas before I was sad most of the time with moments of of happiness. So, um, so I think of the opposite way of living, where you're happy most of the time with normal moments of sadness or disappointment or self doubt or fear, is better than than the than the opposite. So, um, yeah. <laughs> What your experience is is really similar to a lot of other folks who are sort of living a more minimalist lifestyle. I don't know if you've ever if you're familiar with the minimalists, the the two guys who run that that blog. No. Um, That what you just said is exactly sort of what their overall, I don't know, sort of mission in life is to sort of say, you know, a simpler lifestyle is almost always going to be better. You're going to be happier. You're you're not going to be in the pursuit of all of this stuff. And and it just seems that it's very much in parallel. It's I think they're at the minimalists.com or dot org. One of one of the two. They they they'd be interesting for you to to check out because I think that you're very much simpatico with them. But over on the Facebook groups, um, you address your experience as a woman of color. the world. And on one of the threads where that came up, it got hijacked by some, we'll just say some pretty awful people. (laughs) But I was wondering if you'd be willing to kind of share your experience because you put a message on there that I thought resonated with a lot of people. And I, what I liked about it most was that it was kind of like a more hopeful message from your perspective and maybe even just share sort of what you said on there, because I thought it was pretty, pretty, pretty great. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, Well, I think the gist of what I said was probably um, the fact that as far as being, you know, there are issues in the world uh, that no one is denying that, yes, there are issues in the world, there are bad people, um, and there are be- people who hate people based on the color of one's skin and things like that. But 
to live your life in fear and to not go out based on those issues is counterproductive to everything. I mean, I've been on the road for six, well, let's see, counting 2013, six months. I've been on the road for about 16 months, almost 17 months. And, um, and I haven't had any bad experiences in places where I thought people might be a little bit more, um, you know, um, sensitive or, or notice they would notice my, the color of my skin places. I thought that I would go and have bad experiences. I had the best experiences. So I think the gist of my message on that Facebook group was that you shouldn't let the color of your skin or who you are, whether you're a woman, um, traveling alone, don't let those things stop you. It's just common sense. You go out there, you use caution and you live your life. And, and, um, and so the idea for me now, outside of what I said in the Facebook group, um, I don't think about me being black. I just think I'm a person, and I'm riding my bicycle, and I'm meeting other people, and in some way I'm going to connect with them. And if they had any preconceived notions about who I would be, I would hope that through meeting me and seeing the type of person that I am, that I've broken whatever whatever preconceived notion they've had. So. Yeah, I th- thank you for sharing that because I think that one of the things that I've been wanting to do through this podcast and elsewhere is I I think bicycle touring is amazing. I think traveling the world by bike is amazing, and I'd like mm-hmm. to see that to be as inclusive as possible. There were I just remember the thread. Just <laughs> you got a lot of positivity mm-hmm. from that, so I was really really excited to see that. Well, yeah, and a lot of people ask that question. I get that question a lot, and I think the first thing that you need to do is to let go of that fear of of thinking that you're going to be perceived a certain way because of the color of your skin or because you're a woman you just need to get out there and 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 do it because quite frankly even if you are stationary in one town or one city those things can happen to you as well i mean and i think i said that actually when i responded is you know bad things can happen and are more likely to happen when you're stationary than they are when you're moving and traveling and seeing the world so do you want you know, do you want bad things to happen while you're doing nothing or do you want bad or do you bad things won't happen? But, you know what I'm saying? You if you're just living your life and and going along, things are less likely to happen. And and I try to tell people that because I, you know, I haven't had any bad experiences and and I'm so proud of that. Yeah, I think that your message was really good because if you use that as a, a reason or excuse to be paralyzed, you're not going to be able to live your life as well as you could. And I'm glad that you're not letting that hold you back. That's really fantastic. And I'm I'm hopeful that uh, uh, you will continue to have wonderful experiences because you're an awesome person. And I think that, that, that that's the most important thing right there. Hey, I wanted to read uh, one of one of your uh, another one of your Facebook posts because I thought this was this was really also well said. Oh. What do you like most about living on a bicycle? When I am riding, I feel powerful. I don't feel fat. I don't feel ugly. I feel like the most beautiful person in the world, exploring some of the most beautiful places. It was this year while bicycling that I finally said to myself something I've never said before. I like me. I like myself. Does that paragraph sum up 2016 for you? And if so, or if not, actually, why don't we just say, does that sum up 2016 for you? And maybe discuss yeah, that's the simplest answer I can give. Yes, that that was in response to how people were feeling and um, and what bicycling and traveling has done for me. Um, that's that's the summary of my year <laughs> for sure. I just really like in those few words that you demonstrated what this adventure is doing for you personally. And I think that's just really awesome. What are your goals for 2017, given the prism of what 2016 has given you? So um, 2016 was very much so about confidence building once again, um, because there are so many levels of confidence in your life. You you can be confident in one area, but not really confident in another area. And so for me, building up confidence as a cyclist, as a traveling vagabond, um, and, and becoming good at at being a vagabond and, and changing my mentality to... I'm living on the road now. This is my life. Um, that was something I was working on in 2016. And now that I think I've, I've fallen into a pretty good groove um, of that, now the next level for me is, is my music, which is my personal dream. It's You know, I, I want to live my life where I have no regrets. And I like opportunities. I like different paths. 
and I want to live my life open so that if there is an opportunity in front of me that I am open enough to see it and take advantage of it. So for me, I set up goals and objectives, but I'm not so stuck on those goals and objectives so as to miss everything else that could possibly be coming my way. Um, So I I hope that in 2017, I'm open to great opportunities, but I also want to focus more on the musical side of my journey, stopping and playing with different musicians and learning from them because I still have a long way to go as far as skill set goes on my instrument of violin. So I want to continue to learn and suck up all the musical culture of the different towns. And and, and this year, hopefully it'll be countries because I plan on uh, traveling to my first overseas country, which will be South Korea. So I'm hoping to suck up as much musical culture as possible around the world. And, um, And I just have to find a way to do that in a way that actually helps me to progress. Because when you're on the road, there's lots to think about. There's, you know, where am I going to sleep? What am I going to eat? And by the time you've done 12 hours of cycling, the last thing you want to do is practice violin. <laughs> so, so I can find, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so finding a groove for me, um, as far as the musical side of my dreams goes, is is going to be my goal for 2017, and becoming more confident in that aspect. Being a confident musician and a confident street performer is something that I'm, I'm I want to do. And for Fiji too. <laughs> oh, of course. Yes. Oh, Fiji, Fiji, of course. I'm training Fiji currently. I don't know if I'll be successful, but I'm training her to hold a bucket that says uh, donations accepted while I'm busking. So she'll go around with a little bu- bucket so people can drop money in the bucket instead of my violin case. And that'll make Fiji a lot more. Um, what's, what's the What am I trying to say? She'll be more uh, helpful. <laughs> Yes, yes. She can earn a percentage of the uh, proceeds from that, right? Exactly. <laughs> She's earning her keep from just, well, you know, she earns her keep either way because she runs alongside the bicycle. So me not having to pull her uh, in the back trade is amazing, but, but oh, she does I'm, a lot. I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I'm excited to continue following you. I'm, I'm really excited to hear more about your adventures in the South this winter. And then, of course, as you proceed overseas, how can Pedal Chef listeners follow and even pitch in for your adventures? Uh, they can go to www.fijapaw.com. Fijapaw, F-I-J-A-P-A-W. It stands for Fiji and Jasmine Pedal Around the World. And if you go to that site, um, there is a support us page. And on that page, I do have a donation link, but I much so prefer to meet people, work in your home. If I'm coming through your town and you have some work for me to do, I'd love to do it. <laughs> oh, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. So everybody uh, take a look at Fijapaw.com and I'll have a link in the show notes, of course. Jasmine, thank you so much for spending time with us today and uh, telling us all about your adventure. I'm really excited to read more about uh, everything that's in front of you. It sounds really great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net. Lots of great content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregator. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his debut album. Track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Habitat, wherever cool music is available. 